So having a virus slide into your DMs and say, hey, baby, make these uh, particles for me and then die isn't the best um, way to keep alive. So a lot of uh, cells in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes have come up with ways to sort of block horizontal gene acquisition here because overall, uh, the likelihood that something bad is going to happen to you is higher than the likelihood of something neutral or nice. So uh, cells have a couple of different ways to deal with this. So a CRISPR, okay, which you've probably heard a lot about, a clustered interspaced short palindromic repeat, that'll probably be a quiz question, um, are basically bacteria's way of recognizing uh, foreign DNA. Okay? And then we have uh, different bacterial isolates that have different CRISPRs based on different things they've run into in the past. Um, right next to this CRISPR area, we have these CAS genes, okay? So CAS stands for CRISPR associated, all right? So when we say CRISPR CAS9, that means it's the CRISPR section plus a CRISPR associated gene 9, okay? And so these little repeats, surprisingly, we see these little hairpin structures forming again with the um, self-recognizing sequences on the ends, okay? So what CRISPR basically means is that a bacteria in particular, the system is from bacteria, uh, where they acquire a collection of foreign DNA for future reference. And they say, okay, this was a problem, this was a problem, and I'm going to keep it in my genome so that I can check and see if stuff that I meet again is going to be a problem. So analogous to the adaptive immune response in mammals, where our B cells are basically memory cells and remember specific antigens that they were exposed to before, this is uh, bacteria's system uh, analogous system. So fragments of invading DNA okay, get if the cell uh, survives, manages not to die from a particular phage infection. Okay, if we have these little bits of DNA, which are referred to as protospacers, where some bacteria survive and they put this little bit of phage genome as a new spacer in their CRISPR sequence, their uh, short palindromic repeats, their little cluster system here. Okay, So then we get the stem loop formation here, okay? This new little spacer, it forms little little stem loops, and then uh, they'll get tr transcribed out, okay? The repeats will be cut out. They have a little bit of the spacer on the ends, and these little bits of DNA will float around in the cell and basically wait. And they might match up with a, a phage trying to infect that cell. The phage is releasing its RNA into the into the cell, and then this sRNA is going to actually match up to that. And when the um, bacteria is actively looking for these particular matching sites, uh, in terms of either uh, restriction endonucleases or other targeted enzymes, and once this match is made, this this can't uh, bind anymore. This can't be transcribed because it's sort of stuck. It's got this sticker put on it, basically saying nope. Okay, and then um, bacterial enzymes are looking for sort of these segments of double-stranded RNA so that they can go chop them up, okay? So these are the little, like, the um, uh, spacers here are the little warning signs in case they meet any particular phage DNA, and then they can flag them through the cell and target them for destruction. Okay. So here's our, when they form that um, spacer sequence there, uh, they've got the um, CRISPR array, which is going to, so this is the little spacer sequence, and it's going to get um, transcribed, and then this sequence will target that complementary foreign nucleic acid. Okay. Doesn't actually show the degradation of the invading DNA, screw you title. Okay. So uh, CRISPR, we can end up using this as a gene editing tool, at least to make a particular cut in a particular area of the genome, so you can have targeted gene insertion. And so far, um, you know, every, all the pop media is like CRISPR. It's so easy. It's not. It's really not that easy. It's a very, um, the idea is simple, but the actual carrying it out is difficult because you need to um, change it up for not just every species, but every particular strain of a species because the site insertion uh, sequence has to be so precise. But it is possible. It's a very interesting tool, but not as simple as like mainstream science media would have you believe. Okay. Another tool that bacteria in particular use in order to target foreign DNA are restriction endonucleases um, that are cleaving uh, recognition sites. So it's looking for this particular spot. Uh, and this is ECO. So E. coli restriction one was one of the first um, restriction en enzymes discovered. And 
So they're looking for, they're called restriction enzymes because they're restricted. They're looking for a specific site to cut. They won't cut anywhere else. So in this case, um, this particular enzyme is looking for this exact sequence. Okay. And then it's going to, it's a little paramolecular scissors. It's going to cut the backbone in this particular spot, leaving a sticky end. Okay. And making a double strand break. So this is, uh, these double strand breaks are um, easy for um, other nuclease enzymes that are going to come chop that up into pieces and break up the, the viral DNA. Well, then how come bacteria aren't like constantly chopping up their own chromosomes? Well, on foreign DNA, these sequences are not methylated. There's no epigenetic protection, okay? But in the E. coli genome, these sequences have little methyl groups attached to the phosphodiester um, backbone. And E. coli R1 cannot grab onto that. It can't cut at the sentence because the, it's protected, it's methylated, and no double strand break occurs, okay? So within the cell, the sequence is methylated, and so um, E. coli, uh, the, the restriction enzyme can't cut it. Okay, right? so it's like putting on a mm, like a Jason-proofed mass murderer protection jacket where chainsaws don't work on you. Okay, I'm great at analogies. So both of those, both CRISPR and restriction endonucleases, are looking for sequence-specific. Uh, they're sequence-specific defense mechanisms, but we also have some that are non-specific. Uh, so bacteria have generally circular chromosomes and circular plasmids. So if they see any linear DNA, they have DNases that basically target that right away and chop it up into little bits, okay? Because it shouldn't be there if it's linear. Um, another defense mechanism is this protein called HNS. Couldn't find what it actually stands for, but this protein HNS binds to and silences AT-rich DNA. Okay, viruses and tend to have higher proportions of um, adenine and thymine in their genomes compared to bacteria, whereas bacteria have pretty high GC content. It's more stable. It forms better bonds. They've just evolved that way. And so um, if you have a large chunk of DNA that's very AT heavy, it's likely, likely from a virus. Uh, so this protein will go ahead and, and silence it and not degrade it per se, but uh, block transcription so that it can't um, be expressed. Okay. In humans, we have some uh, interesting antiviral um, defenses, the, particularly this, this interesting um, uh, enzyme right here where it binds to uh, an RNA-DNA hybrid. When a retrovirus is taking its um, RNA and converting it into DNA, and there's this DNA-RNA hybrid, the protein will bind to it and basically deaminate cytosines. It'll rip off that little extra nitrogen group to a uracil, okay? And then next, when that gets replicated, the uracil is gonna pair with an adenine and your viral code is all messed up. It's basically gonna run that uh, virus code inoperable. And so they've actually seen this in a bunch of places in our genome where we have a, uh, what looks like it could have been a retrovirus at some point, but it's been uh, targeted by this particular enzyme that changed the genetic code in order to make that virus um, useless. So just as a brief, because we're not going to hit epigenetics for a little bit longer, but I wanted to chat about it now. What if those transposable elements do get incorporated? Oh boy, now we have a problem, except we have epigenetic silencing, okay? So you know how we talked about how E. coli puts little methyl groups onto its DNA so that uh, the restriction enzymes can't bind? Basically, same idea. Uh, transcriptional silencing, if you put these little methyl groups on your DNA, then they can't be transcribed. They have to be removed before the gene can become active again. So this transcriptional silencing of these transposins is crucial to your genome being functional. Otherwise, you're just gonna be um, dealing with way too much uh, uh, pathogenic or bad gene expression. So those um, transposins jumping around, the transposable elements moving uh, can cause really bad mutations. It can mess up really important genes. And so sort of identifying those bad regions, those transposins or retroviral DNA is really important, especially in the germline and like stem, uh, egg cells and sperm cells to stop those mutations from getting uh, inserted and passed on to the next generation. Okay. So we got our, our horizontal transfer here, okay? And we get some uh, DNA that 
comes in and starts being active, but a lot, this is currently super under re, um, being researched right now. Not exactly sure how all these work. There's a, little, a lot of question marks in this diagram, but there's some sort of initiation. There's recognition. There's either hairpins and those transposable elements that, the, that our cells recognize, um, how long after that has moved, and then we start seeing the silencing. We see those little methyl groups popping onto the DNA, okay? And then once it's uh, basically, it's firms up over time to silence it even further, and then even more, there's this sort of deeply silent state to try and keep that through. And now there are, it can escape, it can get clean either through um, when the germ cells are being made, there is a period of um, epigenetic rewriting that occurs. Uh, but this is all very interesting in how the um, cells basically protect themselves from invasion by foreign DNA. And in most cases, you don't cut it out, but you shut it down. You silence it with these um, methyl tags. So we'll talk about this a little more when we get to epigenetics, but I wanted to bring it up here. Okay. So horizontal gene transfer leads to genome evolution. Evolution is change in DNA over successive populations, and we're certainly seeing that thanks to these uh, gene transfers between different species. So in this figure, we're comparing core genomes and pan genomes. Now, a core genome is uh, when you look at, say, just take one E. coli strain and sequence all of its genes, and if we just have one genome, we're seeing about um, uh, 4,500 or 4,700 genes. But as we sequence another strain and we look at all, this, all the genes that are common to those, uh, it drops. Suddenly, just between two species or two strains of E. coli, we see that the number of genes that are common to both has dropped. We keep adding new strains of uh, E. coli there and seeing which genes are uh, similar to both. And as we get up to about 20 different strains, there's only about 2,000 genes that all those strains have in common. Okay, So there's a lot of differentiation in, in um, genomes between just even different strains of the same species. Now, a pan genome is basically, okay, well, we're going to take, uh, here's our 4,500 genes. We're going to add another genome, but let's add all of the genes together. If we're gonna, our common genes are down here, you know, or this is our core genes. And then we're going to keep adding all the new and different variants of genes into our pan genome. The pan genome is all inclusive. Everything you've got. Show me how many genes are in two genomes, 5, 10, 15, 20. And so if you look at 20 different strains and you want to see all of the genes that are represented, now you're looking at almost 17,000 genes in 20 different strains. Okay. So the core genome is looking at the similarities, what genes are found in everything. Uh, that are all, all the genes that are all found together, whereas the pan genome is looking at, okay, absolutely everything that you've got, all right? So there is a lot of variation, even just in between strains of the same genome in uh, prokaryotes, for sure. So viruses have a really a high rate of mutation because they kind of have to constantly foil uh, cells' um, defense responses here. So around the outside of the capsule in um, Streptococcus pneumoniae, there's these little carbohydrates, okay, little carbohydrate capsules that um, they infect and they proliferate and there's immune response. And suddenly the antibodies can start attaching to those particular um, carbohydrate proteins, usually glycoproteins in the cell uh, phospholipid bilayer. But if they can um, mutate, if there's a change in those, it's very evolutionary and adaptive because now the antibodies that the body is producing can no longer recognize or attach to those particular proteins. Okay? So viral capsid proteins are some of the most fast muting, muted, uh, mutating <laughs> proteins uh, that we've seen just because of how quick they have to respond to host responses. So one of the things we see is that here is our streptococcus uh, genome here is the CPS locus, okay, the capsule locus. Um, so these produce the capsule and that affects the pathogenicity of the bacterium, whether or not uh, the host cell can recognize that that's a virus. Okay? And so we have these two markers here, the UGL gene on one side and the PHP1A gene. You don't have to remember this. Uh, we do want to know about the CPS locus though. Okay? And so if we look at different serotypes, different strains of the virus, they have, very, they have different sites of the CPS insertion. So 
these different capsule proteins have been acquired uh, differently. They weren't just base changes from a common answer, but they've been actively swapped and horizontally transferred between different strains of virus. Okay. So another feature here that we're looking at, we call some of these a genomic island, okay? If we have a large chunk of horizontally acquired DNA in the genome, altogether we're gonna call that a genomic island, okay? So we definitely see this in transposable elements, okay? Where we have our insertion sequences and we have some genes in the middle, there's an integrase, okay? But this could be in um, our genome or bacterial genome, but it's it's this own little like block of, of uh, genetic content per se that um, moves together. We see it track together. We see it horizontally transfer and vertically transfer. Okay, and so they can be things like virulence genes or for resistance metabolism, uh, like kind of a me metabolic pathway, like the LAXE operon uh, is a kind of a genomic island there, and they tend to be um, very close together. Uh, wise, these spaces are usually very short. So one thing we can tell what a, where a genomic island occurs, especially in bacteria, is remember how bacteria have a high GC content? Well, we can look at the core genome. There's sort of a known percentage, and then all of a sudden we come to this genomic island, and bloop, oh, okay, we're, it's more AT rich. That looks kind of viral, and we can uh, track it, and then, oh, there's the regular genome resuming over there. So these um, drops in the CG content of the genome can sort of poke, uh, really point out where there's a genomic island and therefore a historical horizontal gene transfer occurring. Okay. So this is Vibrio cholerae. This is the, um, pat, the uh, bacteria that causes cholera. And on chromosome one, there are four big drops in the GC content of the chromosome. And looking further, those are all genomic islands that have been acquired through horizontal gene transfer of some type or another. So you can see where the core bacteria genome is, and then the sudden drops in GC content where the um, vi likely viral DNA has, has occurred. So now, if you want to construct phylogenetic trees, this gets fancy because you're not just looking at slow changes over time that have passed down vertically. Um, you're looking at also these random chunks of DNA that get inserted between generations. Okay. So here's uh, Neisseria. This is a this causes um, this is a bacteria that causes uh, meningitis, bacterial meningitis, and gonorrhea. Okay. And so here's one particular phylogenetic tree. And this one is showing um, species demarcations here. Here's the cluster for gonorrhea and the lactemia and the meningitis. Okay. And then if we expand the node for um, this little area there, uh, there's a good amount of gene transfer between them because we have all these different strains, but we're seeing unrelated strains showing up in different clades here. Lactemia shows up here, but also here again. Okay, We're seeing some overlap and things um, popping out where they shouldn't. So it's a little messy. This is where bacterial um, phylogeny gets really interesting because of all the gene swapping they're doing. Okay, So here's an um, example. Of, this is S. pneumoniae again of a lineage. And so here's some uh, sequence data and they're saying this is how the different strains are organized based on DNA data. But you've got some green over here and green and green and, and here's some yellow but we have yellow scattered throughout. So if we do a phylogeny based on pure sequence data, it actually doesn't line up with uh, epidemiology and actual strains and outbreaks of this particular organism. Whereas um, we scale this tree on sequences that don't include horizontally acquired DNA, suddenly things line up. Okay, they are concurrent with epidemiological data. So there is in phylogeny, especially in bacterial phylogeny, a lot of cleaning that has to be done where you have to um, the horizontally acquired DNA doesn't give you a good uh, track of historical um, change over time. Okay? And you have to actually remove some of that horizontally required DNA from the sequences you're analyzing in order to get a true phylogeny of what was related to what and where your ancestors were. And we see this in eukaryotes as well, um, especially genes that have uh, had significant um, uh, horizontal gene transfer events, suddenly that messes up your phylogenetic trees, okay? So these are nematode enzymes, okay? Nematode enzymes that are involved in cell wall modifications or degradation that they've um, 
had uh, nematodes that can suddenly bore through plant cell walls. And just looking at these three different enzymes, if you do a phylogeny based on each of those enzymes, you get totally different phylogenetic trees for various uh, nematode lines, okay? Either plant parasitic nematodes or the amount of, or ones that are on um, nematodes in eukaryotes or nematodes that eat bacteria. Uh, these enzymes were likely acquired from bacteria or fungi and so your phylogenetic trees start looking pretty wonky and they're not matching up so that is something to take into account when you're working with phylogenies is whether or not the gene was a true ancestral gene or whether or not it was acquired through horizontal gene transfer because it's going to give you major problems in building your phylogeny if you're looking at these horizontally acquired genes unless you're looking at something recent enough or maybe you know that horizontally acquired gene has been present long enough in the population to have undergone a lot of vertical transmission. But, so we'll get into that um, maybe in your phylogeny lab. I'll talk to James. We'll see.